Olá! O vídeo que vocês vão assistir agora é uma entrevista realizada por Prince Dorte e Mohamed Marius Koulibaly com o professor Dr. Eden Adotei, do Instituto de Estudos Africanos da Universidade de Gana, sobre escravidão. É uma entrevista a partir da perspectiva e do olhar dos africanos sobre esse processo histórico tão brutal. Prince e Marius são estudantes do curso de Relações Internacionais da UF, ambos são africanos, e essa entrevista foi parte do trabalho final que eles entregaram na disciplina de Formação Econômica do Brasil, lecionada por mim alguns semestres atrás. É uma conversa muito interessante, muito construtiva para nós no Brasil, e por isso eu compartilho o vídeo aqui, com autorização dos autores. A entrevista foi realizada em inglês e as legendas foram elaboradas pelos próprios estudantes. Bom dia. Hoje estamos aqui para fazer a apresentação, para fazer uma, uma entrevista com o professor do Gana, que vai nos explicar... É... Como, como foi a escravidão lá na África. Sabemos que no século de, no, no século XVI houve uma invasão dos, dos portugueses na África que é, escravizaram o, o povo africano. E essa entrevista vai servir a demontar, a entender, a entender é, as, é, o papel das fortalezas, o papel dos fortes é, na escravidão na África. E através desse, desse, dessa entrevista nós vamos entender muitas coisas e por isso vou, vou passar a palavra para meu irmão, do, é, Prince Dorte, para que nós possamos é, analisar esse tema que é o papel das fortalezas no processo escravizatório. E por isso, eu vou passar a palavra é, a meu irmão, e essa entrevista vai, vai ser totalmente em é, inglês. Okay, so, good afternoon. And this interview is to understand the roles of the forts and everything in or during slavery. And so today we have with us here um, a wonderful lecturer from Ghana, and he's in the uh, Institute of African Studies. So, hello, sir. Are you ready for us? Yes, I am. Okay, so can you um, introduce yourself to us so we can start with everything? Okay. I am Dr. Edemadote. Uh, like you pointed out, I'm a research fellow at the Institute of African Studies, University of Ghana, Lego. Uh, where I teach courses in uh, the slave trade in Africa, colonial ruling African responses, as well as Pan-Africanism and chieftaincy. Okay, that's wonderful. And I think uh, we have the perfect person here, you know, to teach us about um, what we intend to do in our research. Okay, so let's quickly begin with um, our first question. You know, we need to have the history of um well we know a little bit about slavery okay but today we want to look at the the thoughts and especially the economic impacts okay during slavery and so well my first question would be like what was the uh, the the purpose for building the the castles and the forts because we did an interview with the portuguese lecturer he's in brazil now and then he was telling us that well, what, what ever happened here or the reasons for building the forts was purposely for military and defense. Can we say the same thing for um, the forts in Africa? Okay, it's a, it's a combination of reasons that led to the building of the forts and castles or, or trading posts because some of them actually started off as trading posts. Uh, I'm sure you are aware that the Portuguese were the first to arrive on the coast of uh, Ghana in 1471. Yeah. The first port they built was in uh, 1482 at Elmina. And um, I'm sure you're also aware that by then, the slave trade wasn't really the primary trade engaged in by the Europeans. Mm -hmm. So it was just for the purposes of trade and defense. 
But then as time uh, went on and uh, the economic interests of the Europeans changed, they became uh, factories for storing slaves before they were shipped across the Atlantic. But then uh, it's also important to point out most of the forts and castles were, or trading posts, because not all of them can be classified as uh, castles, were built in the 17th century. And that is the period when the Europeans became actively involved in the slave trade. So we could see that from that time on, uh, some of them that were built were purposely built to be able to engage in the trade in slaves. But it's important to state that they were also engaged in other trades uh, besides enslaved Africans. That is, they were primarily interested in gold and uh, other products when they came to the coast of uh, Ghana. Okay, wonderful. Well, so um, so moving on. Then, you know, uh, they came in with in the, the reasons to trade, right? But along the way, slavery entered. So would you say that uh, um, Africans lost their rights, properties, and themselves, their identity, okay, once they allowed the castles or forts to be built in in in, in Africa, because we are looking at they building the castles, okay, to establish something. And then along the way, uh, um, something else happened. So would you say that the, uh, the the construction of the castle actually led to to slavery? No, not necessarily. Like I pointed out earlier, the castles were built, some were built for different reasons, that is to trade in gold and other products. But to your substantive question, which is whether Africans lost their rights and properties, uh, it's, it depends on the period you're looking at. In the early parts, let's not forget that the forts were built on lands owned by Africans. So you, you find that the Europeans went into agreements with uh, traditional rulers to get access to the land to put up their forts and castles. Did it. So basically, these lands were leased to them. And there were instances where uh, people they were attacked because they refused to pay the rents that they were supposed to be paying to the traditional leaders. So they were paying rents to the traditional leaders. It's also important to state that whilst they also occupied these forts and castles, there were occasions when Africans also uh, attacked these forts and castles and took over the forts and castles. There's this very interesting case of uh, one Akwemu warrior called Asameni, who in 1693 uh, attacked the what we call in Ghana the Osu Castle, which used to be uh, the seat of government before. Uh, we moved to the Jubilee House. He occupied it for about a year, and the Danes had to pay money back to the Akumi before the fort was released to them. But I'm just saying this to show that there were instances where these forts and castles were attacked by the locals and uh, taken by them and occupied by them at various points. So the fact that the Europeans were in these forts and castles didn't mean that they automatically controlled the people in those spaces. Okay, okay. That's uh, that. Uh, the, the next question I'm gonna do for the sir. Also can explain for us how many African were kept in the fort before being before being taken to the Americas? How many African were were kept in the forge before being taken into Africa to the America? Uh, the, the numbers the numbers vary because the forts and castles have different sizes, and even the dungeons do not all have the same sizes. But at least from the Cape Coast Castle, we know that hundreds to thousands of people were kept in the dungeons before they were shipped across the Atlantic. Okay, okay. Um, was because myself, I had the chance to visit the, um, I think the Elmina castles where okay. the slaves were kept in. And even, I think that was in 2013. And okay. even at that time, you can still feel something there, the, 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 it has a peculiar sense that you, you know that a lot of people passed through that place. 
but um, we'll come back to to that one later. So let me continue. And so you know that with the introduction of uh, of castles and everything, we we had a different dimension of um, architecture before before the Europeans came into Africa. We had our own style of doing our things, our culture, and everything. Okay, so now let's look at they coming in with trade, education, you know, language and everything. Would you say that it, it, that it was fair that uh, Africans also benefited um, positively from the introduction of Europeans? <laughs> this is a very interesting question. It depends on what you, you term as positive benefit. Uh, I would rather put it this way. There were changes that occurred within African society, politically, economically, and socially. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, um, the Portuguese who came in in the 15th century, uh, and the and uh, they tried to uh, Christianize some of them. If you call Christianity a positive influence, then uh, you can say so. And of course, we had uh, some African uh, in the, uh, they brought the slaves from the hinterland. So some became wealthy as a result of participation in the trade. Some states also became powerful because of the arms they got from uh, trading and slaves. So if you were to call those things positive, well, but I would say that uh, certain, definitely certain changes occurred as a result of the interaction with uh, the Europeans during these exchanges. Uh, of course, we can also talk about even some crops like maize and cassava that was introduced from these places as a result of contact uh, with the Europeans. Our languages and uh, some borrowings. So th there have been some impacts, but um, to call it positive, it's a, it's, it's a very contestable <laughs> yeah, I, I I was saying that because I'm trying to understand where we were at, as Africans at that particular time before they came in. Okay, and they also bring in their own style, their own culture, their own language. Okay, and it means that we had extra, extra in addition to what we already had. Okay, so can we mm -hmm. take some positivity out from that? Oh, well, as you, you, you all know, in every human interaction, uh, we all rub off each other, whether uh -huh. positively or negatively. Yeah. So once uh, Africans came into contact with the Europeans, definitely they were going to borrow from the Europeans, just like the Europeans also borrowed from the Africans. And like I pointed out, uh, some of the food crops uh, came about because of uh, they bringing some of these things in there. They also took things away from Africa. So... Uh, definitely, these exchanges some would have uh, impacted by, and some, uh, let's say, in some positive way in the lives of the, the Africans. Okay, and so um, this uh, our next question is going to be a bit tough, or you know, but we are trying to look at how Africa would have been today without slavery. So, if the Europeans didn't come to Africa if we never had contact with them, at least at that time, in your own analysis, what do you, or how do you, how would you have seen Africa, or how would Africa uh, would have been? As you rightly stated the question, and uh, so I rather want us to look at the impact of slavery, because without slavery and the slave trade, and let's also not forget, I need to introduce this, the institution of slavery existed before our contact with the Europeans. So it is, it's not as if slavery was something that was introduced from outside. So if we were to put it in that context, then uh, we can look at what the contact with the Europeans did to the institution and other uh, facets of our life as a result of these exchanges. So I would say that uh, one, we can look at the demographics. We all know the number of people, the millions of Africans that were uh, sent it's across the Atlantic. Yeah. Of course, it's, it's difficult to put uh, to give specific numbers because 
we don't even know how many were enslaved in Africa, how many were actually lost in the Middle Passage. What we usually have, the figures we have, is those who survived and landed in America. So it's, it's very difficult to. And if we look at the fact that the, the people who were enslaved were the ones who were in the prime of their lives, we're looking at people between their teen years and early 30s. And these are the people who, in those societies, will be the most productive, working probably in the farms and the mines to contribute to the development of these societies. And if these people are being taken away from the society, you can imagine the impact it's going to have on the society. And more importantly, we live in a society which is a very, uh, I would say it's an oral culture where information is passed down from one generation to the other. Uh, to the other uh, yeah. Yeah. So if you have one generation being taken away, then what happens to how the information is going to be passed down? And that is, I think that is one of the most important uh, impacts of slavery on African societies. Information that was needed to keep society growing, developing, moving to the next stage. That knowledge transmission, that chain was truncated. And it became difficult for us to progress from one level to the other. And we had to basically go back and start all over again. So we can talk about that. And of course, uh, most of the slaves were caught in wars. And we know what war does. It creates yeah. insecurity, which means that people could not also engage in productive work. People could not go to their farms. People could not do the things that they were engaged in. So... Um, these negative things really affected Africa, and we know the studies clearly show that this is also really one of the reasons why we are where we are now. Not to say that that is solely the reason why Africa is where it is, but it's a major reason why uh, Africa is underdeveloped. And of course, when we look at the negatives on this side of the continent, we also have to look at what also happened to the Europeans who were engaged in the trade. Uh, we know that uh, a lot of money was made from the trade. Mm -hmm. And it also contributed to the industrial revolution because it gave them the market to try certain products. So um, all in all, positives uh, for the Europeans, uh, negatives for the Africans. And uh, we can say that uh, to, to come back to your question, if uh, the trade hadn't occurred at the scale it did, and they're talking uh, specifically looking at the demographics, the insecurity, uh, knowledge transmission, and all that. Then we could say that probably then uh, Africa would have been in a different space. But naturally, it doesn't mean that if there's a peace in a, in a space, the people are going to progress. But it creates favorable conditions for those people to progress. That, that is the way I want us to, to look at it. Yeah, so now looking at the uh, socioeconomic impacts of, of slavery, okay, because in our previous interview with the Brazilian professor, he made a, a bold statement that um, slavery actually benefited Brazil, especially with the economy, okay, because they having to bring a lot of slaves from Africa actually helps them in, help them in their industry, their coffee production, gold mining and 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 everything but he said it was very unfortunate for africans and now um we last year we all heard about this black lives matter in the united states and everything okay mm -hmm. that has to do with racism okay yes. and someday you can boldly say that racism is uh, or happens as a result of slavery because the uh, Europeans or the whites feel that these people were slaves and they, you know, they are inferior to us and and everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in uh, would we have been equal if slavery never happened? W would would they see that way? And 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 also mm -hmm. uh, having not to patronize African goals and and everything. Do you think that if slavery didn't happen? Um, our economies and, and development would have been on the rise. Because probably we have all the natural resources, we have raw materials and everything. Okay. So wh where would you put this? 
Well, uh, it, there's, there's definitely a relationship between the way Africans are treated in the West and uh, slavery uh, because of uh, the positions Africans were in under that very uh, terrible condition. So I will say that, um, yes, slavery and racism, there's, there's some linkage. And of course, like I also pointed out, there were benefits, economic and uh, benefits for uh, the Europeans as well. I spoke about the Industrial Revolution and the capital, the money that was generated from it being a contributory factor to it. As to whether Africans wouldn't have been treated the way they are today, I did not been for slavery. It's, it's, it's a very uh, interesting question in the sense that some scholars even argue that slavery was based on racism. So even before Africans were enslaved, there was this feeling of superiority that led to Africans being enslaved. Because the question is, if there was a demand for labor, mm -hmm. why African labor and not any other labor? Why didn't they go for the Europeans? Because if it was just for labor, the Europeans could equally have done the work. Why is it that it was Africans that it came for? And there's an the argument that it was because of the feeling that Africans were in a subordinate position. So basically what I'm trying to say is that there's some relationship to this feeling of superiority preceding the trade itself and going on within the trade and surviving the trade itself. So you see a long chain that is going before, during, and after. And like I earlier noted, yes, African states, empires existed, very prosperous ones existed. And it was what some African empires had achieved that made the Europeans want to come to Africa. Of course, they were going to, uh, they wanted to use Africa as a route to go to Asia. But of course, they had about the gold trade of the Mali Empire and all that. And that is what attracted them to that space because they also thought they could benefit from uh, that trade. So yes, uh, if the trade in uh, enslaved Africans, I keep on using enslaved Africans because I want to emphasize the point that it was a process that made these people slaves. They were not born slaves. It's somebody who had made them slaves. So, yes, um, it is like, like I said, I, I find it difficult to do the counterfactual because the absence of some of the things does not necessarily mean that the people are going to move on to point B. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that it creates a favorable condition for them to do so. Because if you look around, the countries that have uh, experienced civil war, some have even come back to outperform those which have had relatively stable uh, democracies. So having that stability doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to develop. It's what you do with it. And clearly, some African societies have shown that they could have progressed to the next level had it not been for the slavery. Right, right. Well, so before I move to my last question, there was this, this question that bothers me. Okay. And then I would want to find out from you. How true is it that um, formal education okay, actually started in, in the forts or in, in the European castles? Yes, that, that, is, that is absolutely right. No, well, let's say they started teaching their kids or the kids they had with African women in the forts and castles. And as you all know, you know, the Europeans were first in the forts, of, in the forts and castles before later yeah. colonial rule moving to them into other spaces. So whatever they were doing, they were doing it in the forts and castles. So this... Uh, churches and uh, all Christianizing people and getting them to do all these European things that were introduced basically started in the forts and castles. So the schools were created for some of their offsprings, people we call them mulattoes, and uh, those who were living in those spaces. Okay, that's wonderful to hear. Well, so now we want to look at slavery. 
okay, the impact of slavery on our current world. How how has that affected our current world? Well, I think you, you touched on one earlier, which is uh, the issue of racism. Yeah. And uh, we, we see that daily in the news, what, are, what is happening to our brothers and sisters in the diaspora, police brutality and all that, before we following the, the trial in the U.S. And um, I will also say that for Africans, uh, it's led to this uh, development from slavery to colonialism, which has impacted the way we see ourselves. I personally believe that strongly we suffer from inferiority complex, and that can also be traced to slavery and the uh, Colonial rule. But let's not forget that when slavery was abolished, uh, they wanted to engage in so called legitimate trade. And that was one of the reasons why uh, these spaces were colonized. And this colonization led to the uh, establishment of certain institutions that we spoke about educational systems, yeah. which have basically indoctrinated us to make us feel that everything uh, European is better than everything African, and I think we're still suffering these consequences. And the mind is the most uh, powerful um, tool that any society, any being can uh, use. And if that is uh, faulty, as I think I was, uh, then it becomes very difficult to properly utilize. So you keep on talking about African having resources, resources. Your question is, what is a resource? Mm -hmm. A resource is what the society or individual decides to define that is going to add value to his or her life. And usually the resources we talk about, not that the Europeans were the ones who told us how to use them, but they are the ones who kept on happening on these kind of resources. And you ask yourself, what have we done with them? Yeah. They come and extract these things and take them away. And I'm making a final value for them. But in our spaces, what exactly have we done with these things that we keep on saying are resources? The resource is the mind. It's the mind that and you turn into a resource. So until so we, we basically look at things differently and look within our societies and ourselves and see what really is really our challenges. Well, so um, this has been very, very interesting. But uh, before you go, um, with the other interview we did, okay, we we asked the, the professor to actually give us a brief history about um, a castle or a fort here in Brazil. And then he, he told us about Fortaleza San Jose, that in it is located in a city here called Macapa. Okay, that it, it, it is the biggest and the first castle that the Europeans built here in Brazil and it served for many purposes. Can you also give us a brief history about um, a castle in Ghana, maybe probably the Elmina castle, because I know it is it, it, it is the, the most, or it was the most used castle in Ghana. Well, uh, the Elmina castle, like I pointed out, was first built by the Portuguese and uh, was later taken over by the Dutch. And it became the Dutch headquarters until the Dutch left the Gold Coast in uh, 1872 when they ceded their properties to the British. So from the Portuguese to the Dutch, then uh, to the British. I also find the story of uh, Osu Castle very fascinating. The European, we also kept it as our seat of government. Which is kind of very interesting because you still find in the dungeons and all that in those spaces. And to also still have it as our seat of government was kind of very intriguing. And also, the reason why I find that uh, cats also very fascinating is the fact that, like I pointed out earlier, uh, Africans had occupied it for a period. As a mini that Kobu warrior I spoke about had attacked the, the castle when it was uh, occupied by the Danes, took it over, and was in it for over a year just to show uh, the power of African states during the period and the kind of relationship we, we had with them. 
So for me, I also find this that uh, these two key factors about the Osu Castle, the, that is uh, officially the Christian Box Castle, very fascinating. With the Elmina Castle, um, we hear that, you know, it has the, the gate of no return. Okay, that uh, it, it was the actually, uh, it was the last point at which they left, the, the slaves left Africa. How significant is that? Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you go in there, there's this famous sign of the door of no return, where once you go through that door, you know that uh, we ain't coming back. But what we can see is that uh, now we're finding ways to re-engage our brothers and sisters who were taken away. As uh, I'm sure you followed, uh, we just uh, Ghana just organized the year of return. Yeah. Uh, giving opportunity to Africans uh, who had gone to the diaspora to come back again. So I'm sure while well, it used to be, sorry, the door of no return, but now uh, we are finding spaces for or ways of re-engaging our brothers and sisters in the diaspora to come back and uh, make them feel welcome. It's uh, our blood and flesh who through no fault of years were uh, forcibly enslaved and taken across the Atlantic. And I think it's fair to um, encourage them or invite them to feel free to come back as and when they want to. Um, I think... Um... We have exhausted our questions here and, you know, thank you very much for your time and your knowledge and everything that you have passed to us this afternoon. And we are very grateful. I don't know if Mohammed would want to try and say something. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your your knowledge, your your time and the, uh, your participation for this interview. I'm very, very grateful for, for that. And it, it's so, it, um, my, my friend, it talked, my, my friend talked to, um, so, so I'm very, very grateful for that, for this moment. I, I learned, I learned much, uh, of story of, uh, uh, Africa story, and it's it just that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much too. And uh, uh, it was nice speaking with you both. Yeah, yeah. And I hope someday would we can call on you again for you know further studies and projects. Sure, anytime. anytime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because you uh, know when we actually gave the idea that this is what we want to do you know our colleagues and our lecturers they were all interested in in this particular project and so we are looking to do more projects and to engage um african historians and you know to actually have you know because here in brazil this is something i have realized they have the uh, uh, i don't know how to put it uh, they have created their own story mm-hmm. okay something they want to believe you understand, but that is not the actual situation on the ground. Okay, so we are also trying to, you know, give them the feel of, you know, um, what actually happened. Okay, mm-hmm. because we are we have been there and we have seen and we have, you know, heard stuff. So you know, I'm just trying to pass it on to them and so that they can be able to understand and have a feel of wanting to come back to, you know, know more about. Africa. Okay. Great. Yeah. Uh, I think it is a very fruitful uh, collaboration. We also need to hear what mm-hmm. is the story is like on the other side because we also tend to largely focus on this side of the Atlantic. And I think this exchange uh, will be very beneficial to uh, all of us. Yeah. So thank you very much once again. And, you know, thank you very much. Yeah. Sir. Okay. Um, um.